little higher and set your aim down the right hand side of the fairway. It might be somebody in fault that was waiting for a, a golfer to turn up, but then you turned up instead. Hi, I'm Patrick Harrington, and you're watching the turn. So let's hope and make a good turn on this one to hit it over the house. This is Golf Punk TV. I'm Tim Southall. This is Carly Booth, two time winner on the LET. Hi, everyone. And she's a bit of a looker. Can I say that without getting punched? Yes. Okay. We're friends now. We are, we are. Okay, so what have we got on the show, Carly? We have All Back to Mine with Roger Harrington, and also Jeff Rich is going to show us how to hit a power draw. Power draw, nice, yes. like it. Okay, and we've got tons of other stuff, so stay tuned. What's up first? Uh, back to Mine with Roger Harrington. Hello. How are you doing? How are you doing? All right. Come on in. Thank you. Wow. Give you a little bit of a tour around the place. That would be absolutely marvellous. I, I bring it down my end of the house first. Okay. Yeah, this is very much behind this door. I'm allowed to do what I want. Right. So, so you can't go upstairs. Well, <laughs> but basically, this why this place would be a little bit messier than the rest of the house. Right. Okay. So, uh, we're basically going down to the where all the golf goes on. This is yeah. uh, this is my gym. You know, somebody's. I was told early on if you could bench your weight. Uh, your body weight 12 times and if you could clean your body weight 12 times and if you could uh, squat one and a half times your body weight 12 times I can't right. do that right I, I, <laughs> I, I can get to them all once yeah oh, well I could squat more than that but actually I can bench uh, I'm just under 90 kilos I can bench 90 kilos I can I can clean not quite 90 but into the 80 so I'm pretty pretty decent uh, you got three pieces of cardio equipment they yeah. never see the light of day Really? No, no. I, I get enough cardio doing doing my weights. I, uh, you know, I'd have, you know, speed programs for golf. I sprint, uh, I throw, uh, and I lift. Cardio, especially long cardio, that's only slowing you down. Mm -hmm. It's only developing your 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 slow twitch fibers. Whereas golf is all about having the power to hit one shot every every ten minutes. Uh, okay, you need the stability, you know, need the mobility in order to, to hold your form during a golf swing. Uh, but generally, uh, I'm not too fussed about that. It's more about the, you know, strengthening the core, your stability, and then having the, the power when you go to swing. I can't help noticing over your shoulder, it looks like quite a remarkable room. <laughs> yes. Can you take us down Come on, there? I'll bring you down there. Uh, as I said, the, the, the great thing about this place, this is a working place. You know, as I said, you, it isn't, my wife would probably kill me for not tidying it up as I should have, but I work here. I do, you know, there's stuff going on. <laughs> so, I'm sure we'll have a look at this a little later on. But that's actually back out to where the golf is. Right. So this is, I come down here in the, during the day whenever I need to and I, I do a little bit of technical work inside, you know, a bit of video work, and then I can go outside and hit. I've got 230 yards of an area to hit shots. Wow. I can't quite hit drivers, I've got to do that in here. This is the golf room. Uh, so essentially, you've got your standard net, which is obviously essential, a mat to hit off. Uh, Just like so. I've got like a flight scope here mm -hmm. for doing the the analysis of the shots, the, the, the radar. I've got a, a foot, foot plate with doing my weights, uh, like my, my transfer of weight. I've got, the, I've got video analysis stuff. I haven't got the cameras up right now. Funny enough, you know, I have all the cameras. I use the iPhone the most. Really? Yeah, yeah. just it's so simple. Just put it up, click, and have a look at it. You know, once you get to know what you're doing, you, you, it's amazing how simple just the, the video on the phone is, is, mm. is, is ideal. Uh, so that's why the, the videos are there, but I haven't got them up. So obviously I've got my putters here, I've got my irons and wedges up here. So is, this, is this normal for golfers, professional golfers, have this much stuff? I completely, I cleaned every single item in this house out. Every golf club, old club, every old piece of clothing, every golf shoe, every tee, and sold them for charity about five years ago. It took us eight hours to sell them. We went to a shop and said, the people queued 
5,000 people turned up and, and uh, <laughs> we, we raised 200,000 wow, uh, for charity selling all the old stuff and I mightn't do it this year but I have another go next year. Mm -hmm. I think just you'd be amazed how much stuff you build up over time and the key thing is you never go back. You know, when you're, when you're a rookie on tour and somebody gives you a new driver, you think, oh, this is great. I'll, I'll, I'll have this club and that club. After a while, you realize if you don't use the club pretty much straight away, you'll never go back to it. Mm -hmm. So it, it really is, if, if I'm unhappy with my driver, I'm going to go and ask what's new, what's, what's out there, here? and I'll go forward rather than backwards. So it, 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 a lot of stuff, putters are a little bit different for sure. For, for sure, you like to have a look at another putter every now and again, but in general, most clubs, if they don't get used in the first week or two, uh, they really are consigned to, to, to the dust. This house is about 11 years old, so I was on tour for a number of years, and uh, essentially, I got an ability, you know, golf was good to me, that I was able to build my dream home in terms of golf practice facilities, and part of that was a, a games room. Yeah. So we'll have a look at that. Essentially, we've got a bar, uh, a few of my hole-in-one prizes, yeah, see the car keys, uh, actually not hole-in-one tournament prizes, I won the Honda Classic, got that, I won uh, the, oh, I have to think of the Japanese. You won event. an enormous car by the looks of it. Well, I know, I won the, I beat Tiger in a playoff in the Dunlop Phoenix in Japan, and you get a car when you won the tournament, so I Obviously, I can't put the car sitting on the bar, so I got the, when they gave me a key to represent, I said, I'll kind of have that just to, to remind me. Uh, Bernard Langer's Ryder Cup shoes. His or yours? Well, he, that he, he, that's what he wore all week, so yeah. we, we all got a pair afterwards. Quite a nice little thing. Uh, here you go. This is probably the most famous thing you're ever going to see in, for, for me. Well, there's a couple of things. Obviously, you've got... My one million dollar check. Can, can you hold that up? Can you cash that for me? <laughs> I, mean, I never cashed it in. I didn't really need it. I said, I, no, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just keep the check. You could have had it framed. I, I hope it hasn't gone out of date. Well, it <laughs> probably should be framed. Got your, your keg sitting down here. Where are they gone? Uh, has the keg got anything in it? It does. It has Guinness and, uh, I think it's Guinness and Heineken. Can you pour us a pint? Uh, no. <laughs> would require me to turn it, I'd have to clean out the pipes. Oh really? So you probably wouldn't oh, yeah. want my, po my point at the moment. So I like the taste of Coca-Cola, I like the effect of vodka. Yeah. There you go. But not, 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 I'm not a, you know, as I said, it's really only on occasion. Yeah. Weddings when you win, sort of stuff like that. You'd be surprised how, uh, how confident I would be when it comes to playing golf, to talking in front of people and things like that. But ask me to get in a dance floor at a, at a wedding. Not great. <laughs> it's only on days like this that I'm allowed into this room. But there's a few trophies in here. Jewel encrusted, gold, gold and jewel encrusted dagger. Is that, if I'd have beaten you at pool, that would have been... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so you got, got that when I won the King Hussein tournament in Morocco. Wow. Their Odyssey, when I won my three majors, they make, make up a... Wow. Gold putter. That's amazing. Have a look at that. Yeah. So now, the big trophies. Yeah. Yeah. You haven't seen them yet. I haven't seen them, no. Well, it's because we could keep them in the kitchen. Why are they in the kitchen? I don't know. Just, we see them here every day. They're, mm -hmm. they're a regular part of our life. Every time and you see it, does it cheer you up? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You were the first European to retain it since James Braid, weren't you? Yes. 1906. Do, they, do those sorts of things mean much to you? When, when Not as much. They, they do in, in hindsight when you go down the road, for yeah. sure. The further you get away from it, the more you think, wow, you know, winning back to back, <clears throat> winning back to back in 2008 with the PGA. Yeah. You know, and three majors. There's just so few people who win mm. one. And yeah. one is a. Winning any major can be a big burden. A lot of people get stuck on one. It really is a burden on your career. Uh, you know, so few get to two and even less to three. So it's, 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 there's nice satisfaction in that. And my three major wins were different. Mm. This is one of the big keys about my major wins. Uh, 
the first one, I played great golf all week. Didn't really get much out of the week. Played unbelievable on the Sunday. But I messed up the 72nd hole. And mm. that always left something wanting. Okay, I got my chance in the playoff. Played great in the playoff. Did everything, yeah. But there's always a question mark. You mm -hmm. know, you mess up the 72nd hole, you think, well, you know. Was that a double? A double, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and it, like I could, there's so many stories to it, you know. Uh, but it definitely left something wanting. It was very exciting, great. The second one, Birkdale. I played great golf. I was the favourite. Mm. Favourite going into the last round, I wasn't leading, I hit the golf ball well, everything was ordered, I was on the wrong side of the draw, I came from the wrong side of the draw. You know, everything about that was how you would have dreamed to win an Open Championship as a kid. One by four shots, got the wave of the crowds coming down the end. There was no question, no second guessing it. It was satisfying because I played golf. There was no doubting who mm. should have been the winner. You know, mm. people can doubt, could go back to Carnoustie and say, oh, well, if this happened or that At Birkdale, nobody second guessed mm. That was it. And uh, then I won at Oakland Hills. Yeah. I just stole that one. <laughs> you know, I fully believe uh, I will win, win again. Yeah. You know, I see these things come in cycles, and the great thing for me is I know I can do it when I get myself in position. Uh, I've proven that I can, I can win in that, you know, take mm. that when it happens. And, and that's a very important. I have to get back in that position, but I know when I get there, I can do it. I succeed because I feel I am actually have weaknesses and, and I have to overcome them and I, I succeed because I think other people are better than me and I have to figure a way of beating them. Uh, not because I've never been the one to think I'm better than everybody else. Uh, I only turned pro. I didn't think I was good enough to be a professional golfer when I turned pro. I only turned pro because I could beat the guys who were turning pro. Uh, and very much I've maintained that through my, my career. I, I play my best when my back's to the wall. I shouldn't really be showing you in here now if my my wife had anything to do with this. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a mess. This is a working office, like a lot of people's working offices. Uh, so when I come home, this is where I keep my my sort of gear between tournaments. I, I still have, I have trophies on display, some winning pictures and things like that. Uh, I have a nice little quiet room up here, which is is you haven't seen this now at all. This is a kind of somewhere I can go if I need to chill out for a while, uh, read a book reflect a bit, write a few notes, you come on up here. It's kind of like a meditation room really is what, what it was meant to be, somewhere I can go read a book or reflect, do some notes. Uh, I've kept some of my special memorabilia up here. Uh, these are actually the clubs and the bags that I won the, the two Open Championships and the PGA. This is the famous five wood that I hit to the 17th hole in Birkdale, 200 and 78 yards, or was it 274 yards? Uh, a shot that couldn't be replicated. You'd need all the adrenaline going. Uh, so that's, that's there. Obviously the putters, the, the irons that we use, the bags, the shoes, uh, my winning PGA scores, some of the memorabilia. Kind of keep that up here. Uh, some of the pictures. We discussed the Ryder Cup. This is a couple of interesting pictures here. This is my putt. I had two putts to win against Mark Amir, so th this is, I've lagged it down stone dead. This one is 2002, in the first morning, uh, was it the first morning? I think it was the first morning anyway, I had this putt to win, or to get a half from about 18 feet, and as you can see, I'm celebrating holding it, and it actually horseshoed out. So the, the absolute ecstasy to the, the, and that's the sort of stuff we keep. My mother keeps one, Frame picture of me and it was from the back of the Sunday Times in the UK and it's it's a shot by shot of how I took a uh, 13 out of par 5 at the at the Oxfordshire the week after I'd won my first tournament just to to remind me to keep my feet in the ground so that's my little office hi I'm Padraig Harrington and you're watching the turn so let's hope and make a good turn on this one to hit it over the house Pretty good to me. This might work, yeah, perfect. So if you can imagine it here. You're stuck here. So clearly I can't make any swing going the direction I want to go. 
Now, obviously, it'd be against the rules, but as we're on the lifestyle channel, we're not going to dirty our pants, are we? So that's why the towel is there. It'd be a two-shot penalty in the tournament. So if I get this right, it should actually come very close to my face. There we go. That's directly over my shoulder. Someday it will come in useful. Uh, no, no, no. You'd, you'd be brave to you'd, you'd be brave to play it in a tournament in a cold situation. In a match, you might. Uh, I would if there was nothing that direction, because the worst I'm going to do is hit it 20, 30 yards that way. Uh, and the best I'm going to do is flip it over my shoulder as I did in that one. Got a nice, I got a good bit of distance out of it too. I know that the bunker was there, but it'd be hard to hit it too far. Obviously, we can all play left-handed. So you probably don't want to be adding too much. There we go. Perfect. So I can hit it up to 150 yards that way. Funny enough, I'm actually better. I'll show you one now. I've got a Happy Gilmore for you, which most people have seen, but I'll show you a new version of my Happy Gilmore. Come on, we go inside for this one. Yeah, this is my Happy Gilmore. I can get this up to... Uh, the best I've seen is 132 mile an hour club head speed. So if I could swing that fast, I'd be comfortably the longest out there on tour, but it's a little bit erratic. Just like so. You enjoying that? Mm. It's mad, isn't he? Sipping on gin and juice. He's bonkers, that Padraig Harrington, isn't he? But in a nice way. He is, but he's such a lovely guy. We're going to show you what we've been up to this week here in Mauritius. In Mauritius, down on the beach, by the pool. Awesome photo shoot in with Carly villa. Booth. Yeah, in loads the villa. of great places. In the house. I'm in Mauritius. And where are you staying? Where are we staying this week? We're staying at the Heritage Golf Resort. And someone told me you're quite um, supple and can do some interesting, strange moves. Yeah, I would not strange to me, obviously, but I can do a few things. John, show us you're in a gymnast while we're talking to you then. All right. Comfy? Yeah. Right. Who would play you in a movie, Carly? Um, probably Cameron Diaz. And why? Because she's athletic, she's sporty, she... Um, you think she looks like you? She's blonde, yeah. Um, and who would play your boyfriend in the movie? Oh, um, probably Chris Evans, Captain America. Nice. Um, what makes you cry? Mean people. <laughs> uh, when Liverpool lose. Um, have you ever cried on the golf course? Yeah, I have. I've been had a, when I've had a bad day. Tears of tears of joy when you won. Tears of joy. Yep. So, what was your first car, Carly? An Audi. I was sponsored by Audi when I turned 17 and turned professional. And what Audi was it? An A3. Do you miss it? I do, I love that car. Um, have you ever killed your own dinner? 
Uh, no. <laughs> Would you? Do you think you could do it? Uh, possibly, yeah. I'm, I've been brought up on a farm. Okay. Um, the Beatles or the Rolling Stones? The Beatles, because I have a connection with that with, through my dad. So why don't you tell everyone about the connection with your dad? He was their bodyguard for three years. And didn't you say at one point he owned the cabin? He worked at the cabin. He worked at the cabin. Did he travel around the world with them or was it just in the UK? It was just in the UK. Who's the funniest person you've ever met, Carly? Um, I've met lots of funny people, but I would say my brother's the funniest. And why is he funny? Because he is just an amazing person, full of life, and he has that extra chromosome that makes him very special. And he's also an Olympic champion, isn't he? He is. He's going to LA for the World Games in July. And has he got medal? He's got medals already, hasn't he? Four gold medals at the Special Olympics for powerlifting, so that's what's got him to the World Games. Amazing. And what's his name? Paul Booth. And your other brother's a gol golfer as well. Yep, Wallace. He plays on the Challenge Tour. And what's your favourite cartoon program? Um, I don't so much watch cartoons anymore, but. What was your favourite then? Probably the Rugrats. Have you ever been in a fight in a bar? No, but I would love to be. <laughs> Have you ever seen one? Uh, not properly. Only in the movies. What makes you angry? Um, slow drivers. Slow drivers? And slow golf. Are you quite quick on the course? Yeah, I like it. I like it quick. When was the last time you went on holiday? The last and the first time was this week. So with all the travelling around the world, you've never been on holiday, is that right? No, but you know, we travel so much as professional golfers, I always more so enjoy the time when I come home and, and be with friends and family. Where were you the first time you had a snog? <laughs> Try to remember that. It was somewhere in my hometown where we were with a whole bunch of girls and guys and I was young <laughs> and I didn't know what I was doing. What frightened you? Spiders. Spiders? All of them or just big ones or? Well, definitely big ones, but I'm getting a bit better with the little ones. Well, you can you get them out of the room yourself? No, I, I usually just whack them, kill them. What's the best shot you've ever played? Uh, best shot, I mean, I can recall a lot of good moments, but um, I'll just say my, my only hole in one. You only had one? Yeah. So you're only as good at golf as me then? I guess so. <laughs> was it in a tournament? It was. It was during the... Well, I ended up winning that week. That was the, the Swiss Open. And did you win anything for the hole in one as well? Unfortunately not. No? Not even a bar of Swiss chocolate? No. But I won the tournament so I wasn't too bothered. <laughs> no, very true. I think Cheers. everybody needs a stiff drink after that. That was awesome. I need another. Did you enjoy Already? that shoot? I did. Mm. Great. I loved it. Great experience. Yeah. And to come here in Mauritius at this resort, uh, mm. heritage resort, amazing. You're doing an advert for them or something? That sounds like it. Well, I hope so. Yeah. Wink, wink. What's up next then? Um, oh, I know. I know. I know who it is. It's Valderrama. <gasps> Valderrama. The cheeky little sock puppet. And who's he interviewing? Nicholas Colsarts. Hello, everybody. It's Valderrama here. And I've been joined by my very special friend, Mr. Nicholas Colsart. How you doing, mate? I'm very good. Uh, it's very nice to meet you, Mr. Valderrama. I've been looking forward to meeting you for a long time. You know that? <laughs> yeah, it was rather nice. Yeah, I've got a question for you. Shoot. Who would play you in a movie? Uh, I've always thought somebody like Robert Downey Jr. Oh, Robert Downey Jr., eh? Why do you think, why do you, think you look like him? Because uh, I think Robert, like, I have gone through different phases in our lives and I would think that uh, we have, we probably share the same demons. Yeah, and I was looking you up online, actually. You used to be a bit of a bad boy, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did uh, have a bit of fun at times. Yes, we did. 
What did you use to get up to? Come on, you can tell me. I'm only a puppet. <laughs> well, you gotta tell. You gotta promise me you keep your mouth shut. I'll keep your mouth shut. Right. Um. I'm hardly gonna uh, run off to the papers, am I? I haven't got any feet. <laughs> well, I don't live in this country, so you find you can spread it as much as you like in these English new papers. Well, I'm not the same target. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, a lot of nightclubbing and you know some booze and stuff like that, but I never really got it that much worse than that. Yeah. Who's the biggest gossiper on the tour? Oh, uh, I tell you what, when you travel this much, uh, it's a hobby that unfortunately everybody falls in. Yeah, well, I suppose you've got nothing else to do, have you? Well, I mean, except beating balls all day, uh, you know, it's always fun to talk about what, happened and what happens in other people's lives. Who's your best mate, and who'd you hang about with on the tour? Well, there's only one guy that's standing out as crazy name. It's probably the good old uh, German Matt Gase, uh, Marcel Zeme. Um, uh, see me. Do you reckon you'd like to meet me? I think uh, we should have actually done this, uh, the three of us together, a little a little trilogy of uh, of crazy uh, people. No, I'm not in the threesomes, mate. <laughs> whatever, really? floats, whatever floats your boat, but I can't get involved in that sort of thing, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm very delicate under this. Yeah, who's the funniest person you've ever met? <laughs> Funniest people I've ever met. Uh, I, don't know, I think this guy from uh, Golf Punk that I've met a couple of years ago. Um, What's his name? Yeah, something Tim Northwell. Yeah, East don't, don't get involved with him. He's a pillock. Yeah, is he really? He oh, thinks he's funny, but he ain't. I thought he was all right. You know, sometimes he comes with the occasional funny stuff. But yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe yeah, I'd steer, I'd steer clear of him. <laughs> I've had a couple of run-ins with him myself. Yeah, I'm he's sure. not all he's cracked up to be, you know. Yeah, yeah, I've got a feeling that you two would not really get along. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you were the president of uh, Belgium for today, what one thing would you change? <laughs> I would change, what would I change? Um, I think I would uh, settle the linguistic war that we've had over the last uh, decade, I'm afraid. What's that then? You have to tell me a bit more because I'm uh, not from those parts. Really? I mean, you should. Uh... I'm a bit. I'm, I'm a bit flemish every now and then, but not too often. Ouch! Only when I've got a cold. Ouch! Ouch! You just dropped in my. <laughs> I've just you've just dropped in myself a little. Um, yeah, yeah. You're in trouble now, aren't you? Yeah, I'm a little. Yeah. Well, you know, this French and Flemish thing could be settled by just all thinking that we're just all Belgian in the end. Yeah, well, never mind all that rubbish. Have you got anything you want to ask me? What about uh, playing-wise? How's the game? Well, I've had a bit of trouble because, I don't know if you know, but I haven't got any feet. And uh, oh, so really? I'm, I'm having a bit of trouble. I have to go around in a golf buggy and not a lot of places let puppets on. But having said that, I am working on my short game because I'm a bit stumpy. Okay, so you're like a Casey Martin kind of guy? Yeah, someone's at the door. Oh, okay. Well, should I go get it? Could you go get it? Oh, Thanks. Geez. It might be somebody important. I was waiting for a, a golfer to turn up, but then you turned up instead. As we got interrupted there, Mr. Nix, uh, yep. I, I, by the way, have you got a girlfriend on the go at the moment? Yeah, I do, and she's, uh, I'm afraid to say she's French. Oh, see, you're doing your bit for Anglo relations and Indian. Well, yeah, with the French, you know, I've always had this little thing with the French. You know, they're pretty good. Can she speak Belgians? Yeah, she speaks a bit of Belgianese. Uh, you know, I've, I've offered her uh, uh, very uh, intense lessons in the last couple of months, and it seems to be uh, to, to pay off. Does she play golf? Uh, yeah, she used to play golf. Yeah, she she went down to like a ten or eleven handicap when she was younger, so uh, she knows uh, she knows what I'm going through. Okay, here's the last one. Give us a kiss, and then I'm going to say goodbye to you, and I'll let you get back on that practice range so you can get on with your uh, your golfing. All right, then, come here. <laughs> Come here, then, little guy, and give you a double French treatment. Uh, thank you, mister. That was very European and uh, very <laughs> Flemish, and I uh, like that. Uh, I've got a bit of a cold, I've got a bit of phlegm myself, so I know how you feel. <laughs> hey, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nicholas Goldsart. <laughs> <laughs>
The seventh hole of Poppy Hills is a dog leg left that climbs nearly 50 feet to a two level green. If you're brave enough to challenge the left hand ferry bunker, you'll be rewarded with the best angle for approach. But shots that miss left on the approach will find a deep fairway hollow, or worse, a waste area and creek down by the ninth green. This hole sets up beautifully for a high booming draw off the tee. To intentionally play a curve to the left, tee your ball up a little higher and set your aim down the right hand side of the fairway. Slide your hips more forward, rotating them a little bit close to the target as well. As you approach the ball, focus on directing the path of your swing well off to the right while the club face meets the ball a little bit close to the swing path. A slight upward hit will help maximize carry distance, putting you in prime position to challenge the pin as you finish strong to the clubhouse on the front nine at Poppy Hills. Our kind of soldier. It's a new feature in Golf Punk. People who we salute for making the world a better place. And there's one person above all who we've met recently. And the legend that is? Tom Lambie. I was eight years old and started here in Phoenix when Phoenix was a little town and my parents built a house on the six, by the sixth green at Phoenix Country Club. It was in the heart of the depression and not too many people were playing so we snuck on the golf course and I was playing every afternoon after school and, and every day. I was so confident, no, nobody else was any good. A couple hustlers came through town and you probably heard of Barry Goldwater who was, ran for president. I cleaned up on, won a lot of money. And then Pearl Harbor came and I signed up that night for the military or the Air Corps and they couldn't take me for six months, they didn't have enough field. So I played all day, every day, and in that time, I became the best I've ever been by far. Five or six years, I built a little nine-hole course in Scottsdale, and I played the Phoenix Open every year and, and things like that. And, and Rossberg and Arnold Palmer were staying at my house. My son always brags that I made the cut, and both of them missed the cut. Three months later, Palmer won the Masters. Yeah, I, I, I take the credit. I meant to reply to that is baloney. <laughs> so, Tom, we're here in Phoenix, and we asked a good friend of the magazines, Jeff Ritter, who's a local legend of the area, who sort of, well, is a golf punk. Is our kind of soldier we call it um, and he brought up your name and we heard a rumor that you've been considerably under your age on a golf course well it gets easier as you get older it does <laughs> a lot easier yeah I, of course golf courses are golf courses and um, the course I play is called Silverado which is in Scottsdale in the Indian Bend Wars. And it's a relatively easy course. Uh, uh, maybe 5,900, 6,000 yards, I don't know what it is, but it's r relatively easy. And I've been, one time I shot that uh, 21 under my age. But <laughs> my son put that in the Guinness Book of Records, but they, they need a lot more proof and stuff like that. Where did your golf start? So St started. How old were you? I was eight years old and started here in Phoenix when Phoenix was a little town and my parents built a house on the, uh, on the six, by the sixth green at Phoenix Country Club. In those days there were four courses in the whole county. Phoenix Country Club, the Biltmore, which is right here close by, and uh, course in San, San Marcos and Chandler, if you know where San Chandler is, it's a resort town 15, 20 miles from here, and a little sand green course downtown Phoenix. Now, I don't know, they say there's two or three hundred courses here. Anyhow, it was in the heart of the depression and not too many people were playing, so we snuck on the golf course every afternoon after school and played until till it was too dark to play, and then there were two greens relatively close to each other. We went back and forth to those two greens. It was still too, too dark to do that. We hit out of the sand trap until too dark to do that, and then we putted until it was too dark to do that. So 
did that all through grammar school and that's how I started. And then I, when I was about nine or 10, I sold lemonade on the course during the, in the Saturdays and Sundays and started caddying when I was maybe 12 or so. So I was sort of hooked up in golf all during the depression. When did you start taking golf seriously then? I was best before the war. Okay. Uh, as I say, I caddied up until about 1940. And then, then I went to, I did go to Stanford for one quarter because they have a great, great golf course there. And that's, I went there because of the golf course. And I was gonna flunk out and I went one quarter and I could see I was gonna flunk out. So I quit and came home, went to junior college here and I was playing every afternoon after school and, and every day. And then Pearl Harbor came and I signed up that night for the military or the Air Corps and they couldn't take me for six months. They didn't have enough fields. So I played all day, every day for about five months. And in that time, I became the best I've ever been by far. After the war, you came back then I went to Stanford and uh, we had a very good golf team and uh, we won the national championship in 46, third, third and 47 and 48. We were third, but the week before the tournament, the coach got mad. At, we had Bob Rosberg, I don't know if you know that name or not. Uh, he, he was on the team and they kicked him off for disciplinary and we were still third without him, and the guy that replaced him picked up on the first nine, so we were third with nobody. So we might very well win again with Rossberg. Did you play any more big tournaments like the Western Open? Did you qualify for anything? No, I didn't. I, I played in the National Amateur uh, at Pebble Beach in 48, and I still lose sleep over that. Uh, I, How come? I lost in the second round to a guy who, who afterwards won three matches against very well-known people. He, after me, he beat Dick Mayer, who won the National Open. After that, he beat Johnny Goodman, who won the National Open, and several am national amateurs. And after that, he beat uh, Dick, uh, Dick Chapman, who was a well-known, he won the National Amateur a couple of times. And I lost to him and had stymies for one thing. And I had a couple short putts for the stymied and, and he made a, I, I broke my forearm the day before and borrowed a forearm. And on the- In eight, anger or an accident? No, I was hitting, I was hitting, range, I was hitting range balls. And the thing just broke. Uh, I didn't have, I, Rossberg had a terrible temper. He and I were best friends and teammates. And uh, he had a terrible temper. I didn't have too bad a temper. After I graduated, for the next seven years, I worked for a man by the name of Dell Webb. Dell Webb was in the construction business. So I was out of golf that period, except I, I played in the, public links in uh, Dallas and in Florida, and did well in Dallas, went to the quarterfinals there. And then I didn't play much golf, and then I was unhappy working in an office, and my wife knew who I was, and Rossberg had done the same thing, and he got into golf and was so successful, and she said, why don't you get into golf? So. I was 35 years old when I, was, when I turned pro. And then after about five or six years, I built a little nine hole course in Scottsdale. Most country clubs, you have six guys in the club you'd like to shoot and 70 or 80 of them are fine. But uh, I said, told the employees, I said, we're gonna treat everybody as nice as they've ever been treated at a public course, but sooner or later, we're gonna run into somebody. I thought the first month, that we're going to ask, why don't you just play someplace else? And they treated us so good that it was 
five years before he ran into somebody like that. A lot of famous people played there, a lot of wealthy people. Now, now it's not the same. So I played from then on, it was about 19, 1960, and I played the Phoenix Open every year and, and things like that. And I usually made the cut, but never earned any money. What was your best finish? My best finish was probably the year even before the war when I was, um, I probably was, my best finish might have been 35th, something like that. Money only went to something like 20 places in okay. those days. And uh, I know in 1958, I mean, it was the year my first job opened up, and so I was working at the course and they I got an exemption to play the Phoenix Open but I didn't have, I didn't practice because I was working every day and Rossberg and Arnold Palmer were staying at my house because in those days they saved money now they'd stay at the Biltmore or the fanciest resort but in those days they'd stay at people's houses and Rossberg was my best friend and he always brought somebody with him and that year he brought Arnold Palmer, and my son always brags that I made the cut and both of them missed the cut. That was in 40, 50, 58, and about three months later, Palmer won the Masters for the first time, and Rossberg won the PGA later. So it's all yours, though, and you helped them? Yeah, I, I, I take the credit. Tom Lambie, you've been absolutely brilliant this afternoon. Um, we'd call you our kind of soldier. You are a golfing hero. <laughs> You've done stuff that no one could imagine. So thank you very much. I meant to reply to that is baloney. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>